because I'm the kilted pirate that you can see both of my knees and it looks like I don't have any pants on. <laughs> In today's video, part three of the commissioned portrait, I will show you my palette, how I mix some of the initial colors for painting on top of my underpainting, and at the end, you'll see the finished portrait unveiled and presented to its new owners. For me, every portrait is different. So this time, I've decided to start with the background. I don't always start with the background, but in this one, it just seemed like the right thing to do. I'm going to kind of work in layers, the things that are further in the background, and then kind of build up as we come forward. I'm looking for the type of color harmony in the finished product that you would see in an old, maybe Rembrandt style painting. So I'm working with a limited palette. It's a modified Zorn palette. I've uh, added the ultramarine blue, which you don't typically find on the Zorn palette. And I'm working pretty dark. The overall feeling and tone of the entire portrait is going to be dark with my light areas being pretty much in the clothing and a little bit of highlight in the skin tones. So predominantly it's a dark um, construct with the middle values and then a few pops of those lighter values. I've mixed together some ivory black and the yellow ochre pale and it's made a beautiful dark sort of olive green. It's just working really well for this background. I've got a little bit of walnut oil gel that I'm going to use as well. I want some of this underpainting texture to show through in the lighter areas of the background. When I say lighter areas, I still am keeping the background quite dark on the value scale. If you're looking at zero being white, 10 being black, um, keeping my background in a range of about a value six, seven to nine, and definitely uh, in the center. So there's a vignette of dark area around the outer edges. And then as you move in towards the center, it's gonna get a little bit lighter, but not ever any lighter than the value six. This is going to take us to an overall color harmony of what is referred to as a split complementary color harmony, meaning I have a lot of green, a touch of blue, and a little hint of red and orange, which you'll see in the skin tones. I'm not using a whole lot of blue, but where the blue kind of comes in also is when I'm using the ivory black in the boot, the skirt, the bodice, those are going to read to the viewer as a a somewhat blue or a bluish tone. So there you go, split complementary. The other thing that's happening in this background is I have the dreaded black and white square or diamond pattern floor. I've often tried to paint this type of floor and it is always a huge struggle with me in getting the perspective correct. So not only do you have to have the squares, you know, lined up properly, but you have to have them in the shape so that it looks like your sitters are on a floor that's flat and moving back in space. So I've got a little bit of walnut oil down and it's allowing me to at least start the idea of the floor, get something down. I have to have something to work with so I can see where I need to push or pull a light or a dark. So I'm going to just move things around until it is visually correct to me. Yes, I have it in the reference, but if you recall in the um, part one of the commissioned portrait, I composited the background and the floor together from other reference sources. So it's really not a true floor that they're on. It's just kind of the idea that I was looking for and the colors that I wanted. I'm using a T-square to get some of the background architectural features. This is a molding on the wall. I just want to make sure that they're fairly straight. Just remember to wipe your T-square or ruler off when you're finished with a paper towel so you don't get paint all over you the next time you go to pick it up. <laughs> While I don't want the architectural elements in the background to be extremely visible, I just want them really kind of faintly visible in the background. 
But I do like the idea of some of these hard straight lines vertically and horizontally oriented to help anchor some of the more organic rounded shapes that we're going to be seeing in the figures. To help me keep my values organized, you'll see on my palette there, I have three piles of my green. I have the darkest pile at the top, in the middle is the middle value, and then the lower green pile is my lighter value. But remember, it's not any lighter than, let's say, a value six. I'm using a variety of brushes. I start off with that one and a half inch flat brush. Um, this is a smaller brush. Uh, the bristles are pretty soft. They're not as soft as a sable, but almost definitely nowhere near as stiff as, let's say, a hog's hair. But they do um, present kind of like sables, I guess, if you're going to go comparing them to one brush or another. They are pretty soft. I like the idea of that when I'm trying to push paint around, especially when it's kind of slippery from the walnut oil gel, I find that I can do this more subtly if I'm using a softer brush. Okay, on my palette, I've mixed some subtle greenish gray colors. Uh, want to use those in the white shirt. I'd like to lay in some of the lighter tones now that I have a lot of the darker tones presented and that way it'll help me just continue to develop the value structure of the painting. I can't have the lighter tones and the darker tones without comparing them to one another so I need to set the parameter of how light something's going to be against how dark something's going to appear. While she is wearing a white blouse, I am not going to be using any pure white until maybe at the very end on top with some very thick strokes in areas where the fabric is coming forward closer to the viewer and that way it'll give it a raised appearance, not only visually but also literally because it'll be coming out and off the palette a little bit, I'm sorry, the canvas a little bit because the paint will be so thick. Another thing I'm looking to do with my color addition over the underpainting is I'm looking to make interesting marks with my brushes or whatever I grab. Sometimes I've been known to put strange things in the paint and either press them or stamp them onto the canvas or drag things through. I've used chains, I've used feathers, <laughs> different cookie cutter type stamp tools. I've got a whole junk box of things that I can dip into paint and stamp or press through the painting. But for right now, I'm just using the brush. But I am thinking about how can I lay down the paint in an interesting way. I'm not looking in my style of painting to be doing a lot of blending. I want to let the marks from the paintbrush kind of stay fresh and stand alone. If there's an area that needs another brush stroke, you know, I'm just going to lay it on top of the ones that are there before it, but not really blending them together. I just continue to lay down brush strokes one on top of the other or one next to the other one until it looks and feels the way I like. I'd like this end result of the painting to be very textured and almost give the feeling that it was an old photograph that had been carried around and it's been creased maybe and some of the edges are worn. I just wanted to have this sort of lived in look to it. I felt like that laying down the background, getting all those darks established, and then laying in some of this lighter fabric, especially um, around the neck and face area of the female subject, will allow me to better judge the values in the skin tones when I'm painting the face. I want to have a variety of areas with different textures and different applications of paint versus how much background and underpainting is showing through. So with the white shirt, I'm using titanium white oil paint because it's extremely opaque. It, it doesn't allow light to transfer through it. it. You can't see through it. It's not transparent at all. This way, 
it really will give the portrait a different effect when the viewer is looking at the shirt versus when the viewer is looking at, let's say, the background. There are two different light fast oil paints and the result is going to give you a variety of different feeling and texture and the what you have at the end. I think it will uh, give me a nice change and give a good variety throughout the painting. Now I'm testing some of the skin tones that I mixed up on the areas that are easily <laughs> fixed if I don't like it and also they're kind of far away they're not I didn't go right into the face where you want your skin tones to be pretty well uh, decided upon before you start painting the face so I'm starting with the knees <laughs> and then I'll probably move into yeah the wrists the hands and uh, if everything looks good then I will use these same type mixtures in different values of course up on the faces. The other thing I have to keep in mind is that I want the knees and the hands, especially on the female figure, to be fairly dark. I don't want them standing out value-wise very much. I don't want hardly any contrast between them, the skirt, and the background in those areas. So I have to keep those skin tone values dark. Correction time. Okay, so I measured and I did a very careful underpainting. However, something got away from me on this section of the figure. It's the male leg and hand. I have to move them about an inch, inch and a half towards the center of the, of the uh, portrait, closer to the female figure. So I'm going to take some time and I'm going to redraw what I am seeing where the problem is and make the corrections. It, I'm going to have to move the hand and everything over towards the center line. You'll see here I'm using a dark, it's like a dark greenish color from the background to draw the initial changes, like get kind of the um, solid anchored areas of underneath the wrist and where that edge of the thumb is going to start. Then I can work most everything off of that comparatively. Where it gets tricky is when you're over on the edges next to the background, especially since there's some architectural elements in the background there, I'm going to have to carefully um, paint in the background in those areas. I don't want it to stand out too much because then it's going to be a dead giveaway that something was moved. Not that that's a big deal, but I think by the time I finish and get it all in, because there is such a high degree of texture and an area where the underpainting is showing through the background, it will look fine and you won't be able to tell that I made such a significant uh, correction <laughs> to the painting in the color phase. So it happens to the best of us where you know you've got this underpainting and you took a lot of time to measure and and you felt good about it. It looked correct and you know you were you were happy. You let it dry and then you begin the color phase. And as I was painting, I kept noticing the gap between the arm of the female figure and the hand on the knee here. And I just really needed to double check it and make sure that it was painted correctly because I didn't want it. I felt like it made him look like his legs were too far apart, too long. It just anatomically was distracting for me. So I definitely felt it was the right thing to do to correct it. Now sometimes when these things happen, you may choose not to correct it. It's probably in that case not going to make such a huge difference in the final resulting portrait. So sometimes when these types of things happen, you don't always have to correct it. But in this case, I felt that it would give me a stronger, more well-anchored <laughs> portrait in the end. So the mixture for my flesh tones was pretty simple. I just used some of the yellow ochre pale, a touch of the cad red light, 
And then to tone it down, I took some of the green that I had mixed for the background and mixed that into the sort of peachy colored mixture that I had created from that red and yellow uh, initial mixture. And it gave me a beautiful unsaturated skin tone. I think it matched really well. Now I did go ahead and mix up three value piles of that color so I could at least have that as my initial starting point for adding in the color. I like to see things in at least three values, the light, the middle, and then the dark. That way I can get initial shapes and composition and make sure things are drawn correctly without worrying about going crazy with the values. And then after everything's drawn and kind of laid in, then you can go back and finish up by making the transitions from the shadow areas towards the light planes more subtle and you know make sure that they are working and make sense with the area that you're transitioning in. So transitions can get pretty tight, especially in the hand and the fingers because things roll away from the light or towards the light more quickly than uh, let's say on the chest. So those types of comparative areas, you've really got to get some good tight transitions working. The better you can transition from the light plane into the shadow plane, the more realistic the structure you're painting is going to look when you're finished. For the jewelry in this painting, I'm not looking to be extremely precise. I'm just looking to capture it, to give my impression of what that jewelry looks like. If you've ever seen a John Singer Sargent painting and there's jewelry involved, if you zoom in and look closely, it's really beautiful to see how he'll lay down extremely simple brush strokes sometimes just one or two I mean what was it that he was known for saying you know he wants to capture things in the minimum amount of brush strokes possible <laughs> so I was trying to channel my inner John Singer Sargent whenever I paint jewelry that's what I'm thinking the other thing that's happening here so the light is coming in from the we'll say the left side of the picture plane and that's creating shadow underneath the hand to the right side. So I have to make sure that the hand's not just floating around in space and then I get some of the shadow um, painted in there on the sock and the knee. And now on this hand, again, like I was saying, it's in the shadow zone of the painting. It's catching a little bit of light, but I need to make sure that the values are staying fairly dark probably in that five, six, seven value range, even though we're talking about value of color. So if you're unable to judge color value very well, oftentimes it can be helpful if you get an area painted and then you snap a photo of it on your phone and turn it to a black and white image and then you can see if things are working in that value construct. If not, you want to go ahead and change it before you move on to another area of the painting. This portrait is relatively small for the way that I typically like to work. So it's about 24 by 24. It's a square portrait. And so that gives me the figure head being about two inches. You can see my hand compared to what I'm painting here. Like this hand is maybe an inch. So there, everything's really condensed and compact and small <laughs> and I do find that I'm getting more comfortable with painting in these smaller situations but truly my heart lies in a large canvas uh, I think initially if I could have had my way I would have liked to have painted it probably like 36 by 36 possibly 40 by 40. I did love the idea of the square that really helps focus your attention on both the subjects as a kind of unified entity, especially with the way that the two light shirts are grouped and kind of touch one another and then are surrounded by all the darkness. I've often heard um, mentors and other well-established artists say to group your values. So you want to kind of take the light areas and group them sort of together. They should touch as, as best they can. 
and then everything not in the light area is going to be either a middle value or a dark or shadow value. So that's how I've often heard that grouping your values can give you a strong composition. So definitely in this portrait, I am thinking about that as I'm laying in the colors. So here, the initial underpainting of the hand, it is at the correct spot. I just wanted to go ahead and solidify the drawing. I didn't have anything extremely detailed or fleshed out in the underpainting for the hands. I did keep that hand especially really simple, almost mitten-like. <laughs> so I'm going to draw it and then start filling things in with the flesh tones. I like working on one area or one feature, meaning a hand or a, a knee or a foot at a time because it allows me to work it as a wet into wet situation. Whereas if I was trying to paint the whole thing all at once, I feel like I would have to stop and then things would dry, then I wouldn't be finishing an area while it was wet. Yes, I could put a couch down, which means to cover the whole entire, let's say this hand, with a mid-value flesh tone that was kind of just a local color and you know you would fill in the whole hand and then repaint everything on top of that. But why do that? <laughs> I just want to work on the hand until it's finished or I feel like it's finished. Doesn't mean I can't come back later and you know continue to flesh out some of the detail but I do love the look of how the hand is in the end if I have painted it wet into wet, as opposed to painting down the sort of underlying colors and then letting that dry and then painting indirectly on top of the dried paint and continuing to build the structure that way. You can end up with a perfectly beautiful hand and the look can be wonderful, but for me, just the feeling and the overall enjoyment of doing the painting is increased or better for me if it's wet into wet. Something I heard the other day about painting hands, I thought it was funny. So true though. Um, if you paint hands with your brain, you end up with sausages. <laughs> So don't look at painting the hand as painting a hand. Tell your brain to go take a nap and use your eyes. Look at the reference. Look at the hand. Look for the three. Try to break it into three values. Look for the darkest shapes. Put those down. Look for the middle values. Put those in. And then look for the highlights or lighter values. And then put those in. And don't even think about that you're painting a hand. You're painting the lights and the darks and you're putting them in the correct place in this area or in this feature and the ending result will be a fabulously painted hand. Another thing with hands to get a good lifelike result is the thickness of the shapes, the shadow shapes in between the fingers. You want to really pay attention to that. You don't want them to be equally weighted. You want to vary the weight of the line. You want to have more rounded convex shapes. No, con, yeah, convex, round, <laughs> round of shapes. You, you know, fingers are quite round. They taper towards the end of the finger. So manage the feeling of the lines of those in-between finger shapes. And even though the in-between lines of the fingers are very dark, I am never using a pure black for that. And I'm using a lot of red and warmth in the hand. There's a lot of reds in hands. And these in-between shapes are basically mixed with cad red light and ivory black. I have added touches of the yellow ochre pale in a couple of the lighter mixtures, but in no area am I painting anything that is much lighter in value for those lines than say a value eight? And they're all done with a very dark reddish brown color. And again, with the jewelry, I'm just laying down a few impressionistic type brush strokes 
to just suggest the idea of the different types of rings and trying to do that with as few brush strokes as possible. Okay, time to get serious. We're painting the face of the female figure. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with the neck. I'm just kind of testing again some of the flesh tone colors that I've mixed. And that was from the Cad Red Light, the Yellow Ochre Pale, and touches of Ivory Black into those mixtures. Additional white, the Titanium White added in some of the more light zone mixtures. I'm going to be referring to left and right, and when I am, I'm talking about the left side of the picture plane versus the right side of the picture plane. So here, the left has the light coming in. There was a window in the photo shoot on the left. Also, I had added a stand light with a soft box cover. So that's creating a little more intense shadow on the right side planes of her head. So you see shadow on the right side of the nose, right side of the face and neck, and a little bit underneath the chin. There is some reflected light along that right jawline coming up from off of the shirt. So I'm going to be making sure that I don't ignore that in the ending, you know, final results while I'm putting in the flesh tone colors. I definitely want to preserve that. It's really beautiful, I find. So I'm going to be laying in some simple um, shadow shapes. Got the lights down, and then I'll connect those planes with the middle values. And then I will work with the transitions to really make sure that her face is painted softly and a little more on the smooth side. I can't get as painterly with a female face as I can a male face because she will look too masculine if I do that. So I want to manage the degree of smoothness. I'm not blending, but I will lay down more brush strokes and some smaller brush strokes just to get the look of blending, but I won't be actually doing blending. While I paint the nose, I'm thinking about how the light's hitting that structure, how there is a sort of triangular shape sitting in front of the face, and that's creating this underneath plane where the nostrils are that is in shadow. There's a cast shadow from the nose blocking light onto the muzzle, and that's going to be a little bit darker than the shadows that are happening on the actual nose itself as it turns away from the light. Those are, you know, part of the shadow on the structure and they tend to not be quite as dark as cast shadows. Another thing I'm thinking about as I paint her face, I'm reminded that the face has three color zones. The forehead being that it's usually closer to the light source is considered the yellow zone, and it's usually the lighter of the values as you move down the face, the values tend to get a tiny bit darker. So then you come down from the yellow zone in the forehead to the middle zone, which is the cheeks and across the nose, and that's known as the pink or the red zone. And in those areas, especially around the tip of the nose and inside the nostrils, I wanna use a lot of warmth in those areas. So I've got some pretty strong red mixtures with a touch of black to paint the nostrils and the shadow areas around the nostrils. Then when you come down onto the chin and mouth zone, the third zone, that's known as the gray or the green zone because it's further away from the light typically. Uh, you will have some reflected light as I pointed out from the shirt, but that area tends to be a little more neutral. And depending on the surrounding light source, the background lighting, the clothing, you can get either greenish gray cast in that area. Sometimes it's purple or mauve. Sometimes you can get just sort of a cool gray, especially in a man who has maybe a three o'clock shadow <laughs> whisker situation happening. You can get sort of those more grays down there. And with women, I find you see it more like the mauve and purple tones. But remember, they're neutral. They're not very saturated because they're moving away from the light. 
the other thing I'm managing here is how I paint the eyelashes. I definitely don't want to paint individual eyelashes, especially on such a tiny, tiny face. So I'm trying to just sort of mass in the idea or the impression of eyelashes. She's also wearing a cool bluish, silverish type eye makeup. And I think that looks pretty, so I wanna capture that. It'll help to accentuate the blue, blue-green color in the eyes. So I'm managing all of that and, and also keeping the shape of the eyes, the three-quarter view eye. So you have to be thinking that, you know, the eye as it's turning away, especially that eye on the left side of the picture plane, you can see into the underneath part of the outer corner of that eye, you know, up under the eyelid. And there's gonna be some touches of pinks and reds in that area. Wanna bring some really good pinks and red into the tear duct area so it really adds life to the eyes. I find if you make the eyes are very cool and neutral. You don't really add some touches of some good saturated red. It tends to leave the eyes kind of lifeless. I like seeing a lot of life in my faces, so I'm I'm pushing the ideas of red in those areas. And you can get that, you know, you can get help in that situation also by doing uh, the nostrils in those really strong red tones as well. I'm thinking how to balance the darkness of the mascara and the eyeliner in the makeup of the female figure. So the, you know, the portraits, I don't want to paint that eye makeup and mascara with pure black. I'm only ever using probably a value seven in that area to complete the look of makeup. I don't have to go in with a solid black to get the effect of her thick liner and eye makeup. All right, we've jumped over to the male figure. With this, I don't have to be quite as concerned with you know smoothing brush strokes and laying in more brush strokes. I can do a very painterly application of paint in the male figure's face, and that is exactly what I am going to do. I started at the forehead. I wanted to get some of those darks laid in and also have that established so when I'm doing the hat, I can paint into the forehead somewhat with the edges of the hat. Again, I like that wet into wet finished look. So as I'm painting this, it's going to be done in one sitting. I may take breaks, but <laughs> let's. I think the face took about four hours, maybe a little less, three to four hours to complete. And that's not including the hat, just the face and the hair. <laughs> Let me remind you, you can see my hand compared to the face. I mean, what are we talking? One inch, two inch, it's a tiny face. So <laughs> you'd think a tiny face would get painted fairly quickly, right? But I find that I really have to take my time, establish the shadow shapes very, very closely to the reference image. And that is the main thing that will allow me to capture the likeness. This is a portrait commission. That means there must, above all else, be a likeness in the end result. So I have to really keep that in mind. If it was just a figurative painting, it wouldn't matter as much. And you could either cheat away from the likeness or change the likeness. But here, being a commissioned portrait, I do not have that luxury. I'm working with the same palette colors for the flesh as I was using for the female figure. I did mix up a couple of middle value and darker value piles that had a little more saturated warmth in them. So I increased the red in those piles and in some I increased the red and the yellow if it needed to be a little more on the orangey side. I will not, however, be applying those high saturated uh, piles of paint that I mixed 
all over the whole face, I'm going to reserve those for the quote unquote <laughs> terminator lines. What is the terminator line? It's the area of the face where the light plane butts up against the shadow plane or where the light plane meets the shadow plane. You put a line of saturated color in that zone where they touch and that kind of allows the eye to transition softly and from the light plane into the shadow plane. So that's where my saturated color is going to live. You'll see an area on the top of the nose that does that where it turns away from the top of the nose into the shadow side plane on the right. And it'll be also happening like that on the right cheek. So you have the front plane of the cheek on the right side and it turns away from the light. It's going to get that terminator line there as well. Another thing to manage is the whites of the eyes. You have to really take a close look at the value of the whites of the eyes. They're often value five, six, I've even seen seven in the shadow sides. I mean, they get quite dark. I think the key or one of the keys to exaggerating the eyes a little bit is to paint the whites of the eyes a little bit cooler than the surrounding flesh tone. And I'm using such warm flesh tones that it's pretty easy to get the idea or feeling of cool uh, color going in for the white of the eye. I found the female face more difficult to get the likeness down than compared to the male face. I think that may have something to do with the fact that he has a mustache and beard. Having the facial hair it gives me really good, dark, solid shapes to work with. And it kind of really just propels you right into the likeness. You have that beautiful shadow along the right side plane of the nose. And it puts a bit of the right side where the eye moves into the temple into shadow so you've got some good strong shadow shapes there and then you just pop in the dark bits from the mustache and the beard and boom you have a likeness as long as you don't paint over it and lose those shapes then everything else uh, surrounding those are going to just be um, icing on the cake as they say something to think about is that each feature or section, let's say the face of the male, needs to have its own value construct. You need to decide what's going to be the lightest value in the face, what's going to be the darkest value in the face, and perhaps those ranges are going to be somewhat condensed. So the fact that I have pretty heavy darks, maybe a value eight, nine, even in the beard and under the neck there on the right side, they get pretty dark. So I don't really want an area in the light to be so far down to like value one, because then you're all the way over to this darker value. I'm trying to condense them. So the lighter areas in the face, I'm trying to manage that and keep them maybe a value three as the lightest value in that face. Now, if you think about it and compare it to the female face, her value construct was a little more light. The shadow shapes for her were never as dark as what we're seeing here in the male's face. So her value construct was closer to, let's say, a value six to about a value to. I think it was really helpful having the background of darkness laid in before I started painting the face. I believe if I had left the area light like it was in the underpainting and went ahead and jumped right into the flesh tone colors, I would have probably painted the face too light. And then once I darkened the background, then I would have had to <laughs> dark in the face. So definitely, you know, having the value structure in the background already worked out before I started putting in the flesh. 
I feel like I nailed the values with the colors pretty easily. I, I wasn't fighting with uh, the feeling that comes when you're painting flesh and it looks too light or too dark. Oftentimes, when I'm painting a face on a white background, I always seem to have the feeling that the flesh colors in the value are too dark. But I've learned from experience that if I trust the value piles on my palette, which I can do because I have a value five gray palette, I can compare my values for, for against the palette and go down on a white canvas with pretty high degree of confidence that the uh, colors are not going to be too dark, even though <laughs> my brain or my eye, I don't know which, they're struggling and saying, oh, it looks too dark, it looks too dark. I have to remind myself that more than likely it's not going to be too dark. So for painting the mustache and the beard, I just kept it really simple. I went in with three different values, a dark, a middle value, and then I reserved the lighter tones for being on top where I could see some of the lighter um, grayer hairs on the like, chin area. And then sort of that center dark goatee section, you know, I let a couple show through on the light side, the left side where the light was hitting them. But for the most part, I let everything just kind of be simply laid in. Nah, I didn't do individual hairs throughout the entire um, surface of the mustache and beard. Also using an older kind of splayed or comber type brush can help when you're painting this type of um, texture. Treat the little individual hairs like when you add spice or herbs to a sauce, you just want to add a couple here and there that will help accentuate the idea that there's a beard and a mustache there. Don't try to paint them all and keep them kind of grouped on the light side. For the female face, after everything was painted in and dry, I felt that her forehead could use a little bit more warmth, so I did end up glazing over top of the forehead uh, the transparent oxide yellow with a touch of transparent oxide red mixed in. So I had this beautiful warm glaze that I put on top of the forehead, but her face was completely dry to the touch before I did the glaze on top of it. You'll see the glazed results at the end when I present the uh, finished portrait. All right, let's paint in this hat. There's some really cool buttons and snaps and things that are uh, happening there, and that's going to be fun. Kind of like the idea of we painted the jewelry, you know, minimum of brush strokes. Even the buckle across his chest next to the female figure's head. Uh, it looks more detailed than it is. If you kind of see it in the painting, it's a minimum of brush strokes and it's very impressionistically, uh, pa the paint's laid down that way. Not very blended, just the strokes laid down and not touched again. Did you notice how the face now looks a little bit lighter since we added the darks into the hat? <laughs> you may have to rewind and go back to looking at it when it was just the underpainting, but I pretty sure I see that the uh, face looks a little bit lighter now that I've darkened uh, the hat. And I'm really having fun painting in these little bits of shine and metal and the snaps. I really like that kind of stuff. Okay, so I'm coming up on finishing the portrait. We're going to just uh, put in a few more snaps here and then you're going to see the finished portrait. Ta-da! And stay tuned and you'll see the presentation of the painting to its new owners. Painting. That is so cool. 
That's awesome. It's That's pretty amazing. dry. I just put a coat of retouch varnish on it, mm -hmm. which is more than sufficient. But if you wanted to, like six months down the road, you could put a final varnish coat on it, but you don't. Okay. One of the things I love about it is that Dawn is looking off into yes. this direction and you're looking directly at the viewer like yeah. <laughs> totally engaging. I think it's yeah. interesting that that dynamic was I only wish I had looked a little more menacing out at the at the camera. Really? I know yeah. it's perfect. I was I wanted I mean, to look piratey. Right. right. Yeah, yeah exactly. Playing a part. Like a grumpy old pirate. Yeah. I mean that would be hard. That, right? <laughs> 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 yeah, no, that's amazing. Oh my that's gosh, so that's cool. That's perfect. I have no idea yeah, how to do this. Yeah, and just all the little details in it, too. Just my rings, the rings that I have on my hand, and her bracelet, and, and the I details in the little, swords. Uh, you know, yeah. little flicks of the, the white shirt. Yeah. Wow, the little edges. You know what I just realized, though? What? Because I was wearing a kilt, because I'm the kilted pirate, that you can see both of my knees, and it looks like I don't have any pants on. Kilt on, but because because it rises up, so you're when I'm sitting, I'm, I mean, 